Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, both Fiona and Deborah. That was the most generous uh, welcome to your stage here um, <laughs> that I think I've ever had. So I really appreciate it. And I don't know who's been following who all these years. I feel like I've been following you as well. I seem to remember following me out the West Coast and then coming yeah. back and still visit with you again here. And I hope to do, uh, do that again soon. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to lay out some ideas. The, the slide you're seeing right now, if you, I trust in virtue land, you're all seeing the same thing I'm seeing, is of the Aspen Meadows campus, which is in Aspen, Colorado. It's a home of the Aspen Institute. It's where it was founded right here on this beautiful meadow. Um, but it's not where I spend my time. I spend my time on the next slide. This is, uh, this is an island. I assume most of you recognize it. Um, this is where it's been, this is where the Business and Society program is actually headquartered. Few, very few of, our, of the Aspen Institute's employees actually live in Aspen, Colorado. Most of them live in Washington, DC, but in the Business and Society program, of course, we need to be in the heart of where the action is. But if you go to the next slide, this is the island that I like the most. And it wasn't until you um, mentioned that morning, August 19th, 19, uh, 2019, when the business roundtable statement hit and my laptop exploded, I was sitting right, if you look at the far right side of this picture, I was sitting, see that kind of, you know, long uh, you know, row up at the top of the steps there. I was sitting right inside that building, tucked away at six o'clock in the morning, doing my early morning thing of writing. I would think I was working on the book. And um, it was a shot. I mean, my, my laptop blew up, but this is Starland, New Hampshire. And I hope those of you that know the University of New Hampshire know this beautiful place. It's, it's about nine miles off of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I have spent uh, a week there every year for the last 30 years. But it's a wonderful place. It's owned by the, uh, it's owned by kind of a joint, it's part of a joint venture of the Unitarian Universalist Association and the United Church of Christ. But if we go to the next slide, Star Island is also a corporation. And I think inspired by the opportunity to talk to a lot of UNH students and alumni and friends of Deborah and Fiona and the remarkable institution that's hosting us today, you know, it takes me back into this place and thinking at Star Island through the lens of what a corporation is all about. It is kind of a special purpose corporation, but all, all corporations have a special purpose. Um, they serve many purposes. We can talk about that. But this one, its mission, of course, is very closely aligned with using this beautiful, unique space to the benefit of those who have access to it and to the wider Seacoast community. It's gone through its own moments of challenges, uh, buffeted by all kinds of stresses from that it used to kind of keep its walls up and operate on the island. And it's learned over the years the importance of having porous kind of the walls need to be porous and we need to be in harmony with the seacoast and in harmony with our natural surroundings. And we've learned a lot about what it takes to, re to attract and, and um, you know, sustain the kind of volunteerism that keeps this island alive. And so if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna take this metaphor of Star Island as a corporation just one step further before we dive into the corporations that most of us think we'll be talking about today and that we will talk about. You know, Star Island, I think, does have a lot in common with corporations everywhere. Uh, and here are some of the things that strike me about Star Island. You can't measure the value of the place by the value of those buildings that we just looked at. It's about the, the real value of the Star Island Corporation and this wonderful place that I've enjoyed for so many years with my family. It's really about trust and relationships and, and the intangible sources of value. It's about the license to operate and the ability to live in harmony with those who both have the ability to you know, stop our business. I mean, we had one summer where 
we had to shut down for a while because we hadn't kept certain things up to code and that was a real shock to the system. But there are myriad forces both inside and outside of any company that are driving the change. And the job of the CEO of Star Island has changed itself. I mean, it's much more, Joe Watts, who's the head of Star Island, is much more the leader of a community. Maybe that's always been the case at Star Island. But let's now go to the next slide and kind of stop the Star Island metaphor, although I simply couldn't help doing it, talking to a, a UNH-ish kind of audience today, and talk about these, these rules um, that I write about in the book and that Deborah, Deborah has mentioned. I, they are really, in a way, they're just a, they're a window into what I think of as massive drivers of, of change. I'm gonna go through them, there's six of them, and um, I won't go too much into the details of them because I think some of that will return to in conversation. But I think it does start with this notion of intangibles. When I went to business school, you know, we taught, we taught the value as if we could somehow just measure the bricks and mortar and the things that we'd invested in you know, tangibly and you know, look forward and, and forecast those you know, cash flows best we could going out into the future and finding some kind of a discount rate and discounting it back and saying, okay, this is what the corporation is worth. And of course, we know that's not the case. In reality today, it's as much as 85% of the valuation of firms is actually due to these intangibles. Trust, reputation, customer and employee loyalty, you know, access to natural resources, the license to operate. There's so much more to say about what it is that constitutes business success. The second piece here, which is of course, uh, Deborah you know, talked about the, the uh, business roundtable's restatement of purpose. I like to think that the purpose of the corporations have never really changed. It may have been, and we have lived through now decades of time when the mantra about the purpose of the corporation has been about, you know, it's about enhancing shareholder value or profit maximization. That is a legacy from the 1970s. It's also a legacy of the 1980s when we reinforced the idea that it's all about the shareholders by deciding to pay executives in stock and assuring that they were mostly attuned to the shareholder. But if we sit and kind of step back from the fray and think about the complex corporations and the corporations that figure large in our own experience and, and uh, as consumers and as you know, accessing important goods and services and even uh, trivial goods and services that corporations provide today, you know, your latest app and that sort of thing. Corporations, of course, businesses serves many, many purposes. And it has to be conscious of those as it, as it extends its reach and thinks thoughtfully about its extensive si supply chain and global kind of, um, you know, the, the globalization which we have witnessed in, in our lifetimes. But it's also true that purpose is revealed. And that sometimes takes us up short. You know, if you think back about this tragic um, kind of, period of time that we have lived through, that Boeing has lived through, and we have lived through watching that story unfold. You know, the purpose of Boeing was actually revealed by the failure to put the customer at the center, by the failure to put uh, quality and risk, real notions of risk, not the risk that the stock market may not fully realize what we think the value of the firm is, but the real risks we manage as an enterprise. You think VW, you think Wells Fargo. These are moments in time, valiant. These are moments in time where, you know, you realize there's one thing that, that the CEO may say, or you might appear in the annual report about why the corporation exists, and then another that is revealed by its actions. And so I explore this, but I also explore examples of companies that have, where the purpose is essentially built into their DNA and always has been in companies. There are so many companies that I admire deeply. So the third piece is this complicated notion of corporate responsibility. You know, when I got out of, when I got out of school in the 1970s, the responsibilities of the corporation were twofold, basically 
create jobs, and pay your taxes. I think it's fair to say that neither of those can be taken for granted today. <laughs> and yet the responsibilities of the corporation are no longer defined inside the gate. They're defined, it's not up to the corporation to decide to whom it's, it's responsible. Those corporations, those responsibilities are being defined in real time by remarkably tactical, clever, sophisticated NGOs that may harness your brand and use it to elevate a issue that is a fact of great importance that will affect the operations of that enterprise if not corrected, but also are essentially harnessing that brand to make a larger point and to engage the large system that that corporation is a part of. The fact is today that legally, corporations have to worry about how the product is used that their legal liability may extend to how the product is used. That was certainly not the case when I was growing up. So this is a, is a domain that is um, massively important and remarkable change is happening as a result of this kind of change of contract. Fourth, and this is one that I think we're, we're living, we're all living through in real time, is that I call it the accountability from the cafeteria. We've often, in our language, we often think that consumers are gonna to need to drive change in business, or that we talk a lot about investors and responsible investors. And you know, we, Larry, those of you who follow the business press know that Larry Fink, the, the CEO of BlackRock, writes a letter every year to all of the companies that this massive investor invests in, which is pretty much every company one could name. And they talk about, you know, he talks about, um, these responsibilities and we think that somehow that the investor is mostly responsible for driving accountability, but today it's not true. It's really about the employees. Mm -hmm. And we're in this period of time where it's employees equipped to a fairly well with social networks and with instruments of you know, technology that I can't even begin to fathom using on a regular basis. They in fact are the window into both the risks they're the closest aligned with understanding what the risks are to the enterprise, but also the real opportunities. Employees today have really become the allies. I think they've always been the allies, but in this moment of COVID where we've kind of humanized the face of corporations, I think we've begun to see this human element more clearly. They in fact today are giving voice to both risk and competitive advantage. We've seen this in countless different ways, and we could talk more, and maybe we will, about some of the trend now toward even unionization and to the ability of employees to you know, use their own shares of stock to raise issues in a boardroom or in, a, in, a, in, in the context of an annual meeting. So this is a dynamic area. There are lots of examples to be brought to bear from Google Walkout in, in, the, in, the, in the storm of the Me Too movement to news in the last couple of weeks over Amazon facing a unionization um, campaign, which has had tremendous effect. I'm sure you've all seen the ads coming out on your computer about Amazon you know, supporting a, a raise in the, in the federal minimum wage. Finally, there's this notion of culture and we've always felt that capital was the scarce resource Capital is not a scarce resource today. Plenty of companies go public without even accessing really the public markets. They kind of go, they do a direct listing on the exchange and all of they're doing is actually providing an exit for their early investors through rounds of venture capital or maybe private equity. Today, it's a culture. Culture trumps capital. Talent is a scarce resource. And we see in remarkable examples of companies that have been at this for a very long period of time. You know, companies like Southwest or companies like Herman Miller, companies where they've always had a strong culture and that that culture is defining for their ability to innovate and to drive change from within and be attuned to this kind of conversation between the inside and the outside of the firm. And then finally, I think this is an amazing moment. Um, we could all name those problems that we think are um, the ones that keep us up at night. For me, it's climate change, but obviously it's not, I'm not asleep here. I know we're living through a very difficult time when it comes to human relations. COVID has been ever present and is a driver of how we think today. But when the system is at risk, it can't be 
it can't be addressed one company at a time. It simply requires collaboration. And we've seen in this moment, one of the most remarkable examples of collaboration in the pharmaceutical industry, where these companies that have advanced vaccines in record time, you know, they cracked the code on this virus together. There was a sharing of knowledge, both between and among companies, and also, of course, with the federal government and with other governments that have been involved in the development of vaccines. This is a shared enterprise, and we're all better for it. And so this notion of collaboration over competition is one that I think is present, and it's going to be exceedingly present as we move in to tackle the big question of not only inequality, but also climate change and other related problems. So I think I've only got one more slide, maybe two. So how does the change take place? I'm gonna briefly mention this and I know we'll be getting into some, maybe the opportunity to talk about more examples when Deborah and I start speaking together. But I think one thing that's um, abundantly clear is, and that I am personally very drawn to because I'm very interested in systemic change is a massive change that's taking place at systemically important enterprises. Think McDonald's, think Walmart, the scale of these operations they literally map the globe and their supply chain and their source of labor are globally integrated. The change is focused on them because they both have outsized footprints, but they are also, if we can unlock it, they can be remarkably important change, change agents themselves in driving significant change, whether we're talking about the safety of food or we're talking about climate, or we're talking about any number of other things that would be relevant here in the in the in this kind of moment here, but you know that is, falls within the scope of responsibilities of these massive enterprises. But I also could talk about innovations from within. You know, Eric, a fellow at the Aspen Institute, who's worked on developing a third stream of, of what would be called waste, but it's taking our food waste and developing massive ability to manage composting at waste management. Or Neil, who worked on the safety of cell phones and making sure that they use the point of purchase at AT&T to assure that parents knew what the safety features were and would be able to ad address those at a time that we're seeing toxic use by, of smartphones and the like by young people. You know, there's a, there's a notion of change at the top and we're seeing these remarkable statements by Mary Barra at GM who announced that GM is gonna be in what seem, will seem like a very rapid period of time, convert totally to electric vehicles. Or Mark Benioff, who a lot of us saw in 60 Minutes, speak about his shock to find out that women and men weren't being say, paid at the same rates and that his commitment to recalibrating how salaries are, configured up and down up and down the food system there at Salesforce. I could talk about Dean Shul, uh, Dan Schulman at PayPal, Satya Nadella at Microsoft, who's made remarkable commitments on, on climate and the like. But finally, we could turn back to this notion of coalitions. And I think we'll talk more about this, but the business roundtable moment there and the other coalitions that are emerging, this 110 coalition that's emerging around workforce development. Business Roundtable also landed a remarkable statement on climate change this last year. And then this change is being driven by crisis that I just referred to with the pharmaceutical industry. All of these are forces for change. And yet amidst all of this are those companies, many of whom have always had these kinds of values and this notion of harmonizing the business and its outside impacts and its internal agents and has kind of lived in this stakeholder domain uh, sometimes since their founding. Should we go to the last slide? So the one, one thing I just leave you with though is that I don't wanna make this sound like it's a totally Pollyanna situation here. We know that um, everybody here knows that we're facing remarkable challenges. And I think the work ahead for, for me and my, my wonderful colleagues who have helped 
I've worked so closely with some of them for many, many years in developing the work we've done on the purpose of the corporation. I just use this slide um, to mention one of these underlying, I call them kind of blind spots in the corporation. That a CEO on the one hand over here could be talking about, you know, kind of lofty ideas and, and uh, you know, a, a lofty purpose of the corporation and how important all the stakeholders are. But if their executive pay is still really, if the loudest signal is still the stock price, this is what we call a big disconnect. If companies on the one hand are talking about the well being of employees, but we're still continuing to contract out jobs that disconnect jobs from the remarkable benefits that a corporation can provide in terms of job security and benefits and the opportunity to get on the ladder and continue to grow in a job. These are the kinds of things that I think are, they kind of are, they're kind of hidden. They're hard to talk about. They're complicated. Money and politics is a third one. With this wake up call after the horrible invasion of the Capitol on January 6th, where some companies kind of hit a pause button on their political spending to try to take account uh, with their employees about the work ahead. So these, uh, these, these kind of um, hard to get at issues that confound the decision-making, I think are really incredibly important. And with that, I think we're at, we're at well, maybe one more slide that's just a picture, if I recall. Yes, we have to, we should have that. Oh, the book. There's the yes. book. Yes. <laughs> 